So let's continue with where we left off. So we have finished with the previous lecture, which is lecture 6.1, bulk micromachining. So we are at the, <clears throat> the next one of micromachining topic is surface micromachining. Now, surface micromachining. Okay, so what it is, we know that... So, so we're going to review again what's the difference between bulk and surface micromachining. And then we look at the concept of structural and sacrificial layers, surface micromachining steps, all the process steps involved, the deposition techniques of different layers, and then some problems relating to surface micromachining, which are uh, stiction problems, and what are the proposed solution for stiction problems. Okay, and I'm going to show you some examples of complex 3D structures. So this, this topic will be um, slightly lighter and, and uh, less heavy compared to the bulk micromachining. Okay, because most of the things I'm going to discuss here is something that is very similar to what you have learned in the IC fabrication course. Now let's look at the difference between bulk micromachining and surface micromachining. So what's the difference between bulk and surface micromachining? So bulk micromachining involves removing via etching parts of a bulk material and shaping it to the desired device divine structure. Can also involve the position of additional structural layers. Surface micromachining, on the other hand, involves depositing devices, uh, depositing device structural layers on a support substrate and shaping them to the desired device design structure. The substrate itself is not modified, but only as a foundation platform for the surface micromachining. Only new layers are deposited on top of the substrate. Okay, but both process, either bulk or surface micromachining, can involve deposition of sacrificial layers. So, kalau saya nak, if I were to explain to you again the difference, now you have seen in the last topic, bulk micromachining, you have your substrate, the, the silicon wafer itself, and then you etch away parts of the substrate according to the pattern of your device in order to get the final structure. So you, you etch away, you, you, you pattern and you etch away the, the material itself, the bulk material. For surface micromachining, the bulk material, your silicon wafer is just your platform or is just your support. Okay, it's just basically a, a substrate. Okay, and then you deposit additional layers on top, which are the structural layers. These structural layers are the layers or material that will form the final structure of your device. So what you do after depositing this structural layer, you etch away or you pattern these additional structural layers. So all the additional layers that you put on top, you will pattern it and structure it until you get your desired structure. You do not touch the, the bulk uh, support material, which is your silicon wafer. However, in certain devices, we may combine both bulk micromachining or surface micromachining. Now let's look at structural layers. In more detail, it forms the whole or parts of the device structure on a substrate. It can be moving or non-moving parts, and it can be rigid or flexible. Okay, so you look at the examples down here I've showed you. So on the left-hand side, you have a glass substrate, and then on top, you have silicon carbide. Okay, forming a rigid structure on top of your substrate glass. So this is the, the silicon carbide on top is the structural layer. And then on the... In the middle here, you have some pop-up structure. So these are also your structural layer. Okay, in this case, these structural layer are rigid but also flexible at certain parts. Okay, to enable it to move in order to, to function as your MEMS device. And then lastly, on the right-hand side here, you have your cantilever beam. Okay, your cantilever beam, which is in the purple in color. Underneath that, the support material is silicon nitrate or silicon substrate, okay, and then you have some interficial, uh, interficial layer in, in between an insulator, okay, and then the structure itself is the cantilever beam, right. On the other hand, sacrificial layer, the definition of sacrificial layer is a layer that forms temporary layers to aid 
or cover or support the patterning and machining of the structural layer. It is non-moving and it can be elemental, compound or polymer. Must be able to be removed at the end of the end of fabrication. Therefore, the end product or the final structure of your MEMS device will not contain any sacrificial layer. Okay, so that means sacrificial layer is only there to aid the fabrication process during either etching or surface micromachining. You can imagine sacrificial layer to be similar to, uh, you can imagine sacrificial layer to have a, a function similar to your uh, photo, photo resist. You know, photo resist is there just to aid to transfer the pattern, right, from the mask onto your wafer so sacrificial layer is basically something that helps you to to pattern your your structure either via etching or via photolithography okay let's look at an example down here so let's say we want a final structure that looks like this so we want to have the gray material is your structural material okay and then your structural material is a box inside the box you have some hollow body with some more structures inside so this can be considered as a very complex structure so how do we how can we uh, machine such a structure so with the help of a sacrificial layer okay let's look at the first step so the first step you have the first layer of sacrificial material the one in orange here on top of your substrate and then you put the first layer of your structural layer on top okay and then you use etching to you use etching to remove parts of the material the structural material that you don't want similar uh, so you will end up with with only one layer which is here and here right and then you repeat the process for each additional layer all right so all this can be repeated a few times so as additional layer until you get the final structure and at the final structure you will use a solvent or you use a plasma to remove away all the sacrificial layer leaving behind a hollow body inside your structural uh, layer okay so example structural layer materials okay of course you can have your silicon either amorphous silicon polysilicon or monocrystalline silicon silicon oxide or quartz Quartz is basically just a, a kind of silicon oxide which have a specific uh, crystal structure. Okay, and then you have uh, metals like titanium, copper, gold, aluminium, chromium, or any alloys of all the metals that you can use. And it can also be compound like sil silicon nitride, silicon carbide. Okay, sacrificial layers on the other hand can be silicon oxide most commonly used is silicon oxide especially if you are doing etching okay and then sometimes photoresist you can use polymide uh, and other organic materials like polymers okay and sometimes you can use metal as well such as copper but very rarely it depends on the type of structure that you want and then it depends on the structural material that you're trying to pattern but most of the time it's either silicon oxide or uh, all these polymer material organic materials okay now in this slide is the basic steps for surface micro machining process so this is a basic sacrificial layer processing it's very simple there's five steps um sometimes there's six okay depending uh depending on on the type Okay, but as long as you know and remember all these five steps, you are safe. Because for any structure that you want to, to, to fabricate using surface micro machining, you are simply repeating these five or six steps over and over again for, for all the layers until you get the desired pattern that you want. Uh, okay, so the first, the first step is deposition of sacrificial layer. Alright, so this is your, let's say this is your substrate, let's say it's a silicon. Okay, so this is your sacrificial layer, it can be anything. So maybe it can be silicon oxide, it can be photoresist and so on. And then you patterned your sacrificial layer. Patterning of the sacrificial layer, by normally by photolithography. Lithography, followed by etching. 
right? So you have a mask and then you transfer the pattern onto the onto the sacrificial layer. And of course, if you use photolithography, you need to add the photo, photo resist and, and all that. So this step number two itself is is uh inside the step number two you have sub steps okay which is the photolithography steps you have all the other steps but you don't have to mention it you just have to mention that the patterning of the sacrificial layer via photolithography and etching so that is can 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 be considered as one one big step okay and then you etch away this part leaving only this exposed region here Okay, once you have exposed that region there, you want to deposit your structural layer. So step number three is to deposit your structural layer. Again, and normally this deposition is conformal deposition. What do I mean by conformal deposition? It is a deposition of thin film whereby the thin film that you deposit will follow the topography of the surface of your substrate. Okay, as you can see here, there are the tangga kan because of the the patterning that you do so the the layer that you deposit on top the structural layer must follow the topography you must follow the shape or the pattern or maybe I, I should say the the texture of the surface right so that's what we mean by conformal deposition so that's step number three step number four liquid phase removal of sacrificial layer so once we have produced our structural layer here the one in black color Okay, now we want to remove this sacrificial layer. So we remove it by using etchant or using the solvent for the for the sacrificial layer. Okay, so depending on the material that you use for the sacrificial layer, you can use whatever chemical or liquid or sometimes plasma, okay, if you want to do dry etching to remove completely the sacrificial layer. And the process of this removal of sacrificial layer, you must make sure that it will not affect both the substrate and the structural layer. So the structural layer and the substrate must be immune to the whatever chemical or process you use to remove the sacrificial layer. So now after step number four, your sacrificial layer has gone. Okay, it has been uh, removed or etched away. So once you have done that, if you are doing liquid phase removal, Okay, it can be uh it can be vapor phase. Alright, so if you are using liquid phase, then step number five will be the removal of liquid or basically drying. So you want to dry all this, uh all the excess solvent or etchant that you use to re in removing the sacrificial layer. Normally those uh liquid will 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 tend to aggregate or tend to be stuck inside underneath the structure like this. Okay, due to the surface tension of the liquid. So in order to remove them completely, we need to have a, a proper drying process before it is ready. Okay, any question regarding the basic uh, steps in surface micromachining? So, basically these are the steps that you need to remember, that's all. Even if you don't remember, it's okay because it's in your notes, right? So your your test and your exam will be will be open book anyway. So no problem. So it will be easy for you. This is another, just an example. Okay, the same steps, but for you to produce different structures. So you can have a look. Okay, uh, even if we are producing different structure, the steps that we take are still the same. Alright, so typical device realized by surface micromachining. Okay, the, uh, these are the other kind of structure that we, uh, we can produce by surface micromachining. Here, um, we are producing a plate of material. So this is a plate of material suspended, su sorry, suspended on top of your substrate, supported by a hinge or basically an anchor. And then maybe it can move up and down. Okay, in such a uh, in such a structure here, all right, we have etched these four holes in uh at the middle of the plate, okay, because etch holes are required to reduce the time for removing sacrificial layer underneath large area structure. Because since this is suspended underneath is your structural layer that you must remove before your device is ready. So if you don't have the hole, you expect the, the solvent or the etchant to go inside to remove the 
uh, structure layer uh, the sacrificial layer underneath from the sides so kalau nak mengharapkan cecair itu masuk daripada tepi kadang-kadang susah dan makan masa yang lama so if by having some holes at the top okay etchen can enter inside and etch away your sacrificial layer underneath so it will speed up the process and secondly it can ensure that all the remaining sacrificial layer or residue is removed okay another example structure an inductor all right and then out of plane structure so you can have a structure which is on the surface and then after you have done the patterning you can use um heating process at the hinge here all right to to pull up the structure and it becomes a out of plane structure so it is suspended hinges okay so this is the kind of things also for mechanical structures for mems device in uh, that you can produce by using surface micro machining okay an actual hinge similar to like the hinge that you have on your door or something like that okay so how do we produce this kind of structure Okay, so yeah, ini memang a very popular question last time uh, for the exam because it's relatively complex. So because I want the students, I want to make sure that the students know how to to design the process for surface micro machining. I'll give them like a picture of the final structure that they need to achieve, and then they need to to design the process, and then draw the step by step evolution of the pattern. So I might do the same, but maybe for more complex structure or something like that. So here, what I want to show is for this kind of hinge structure, we um I can design a flow of the process from step one to step seven. Okay, so as you notice now, I have extra steps, step six and seven. This is because my my structure is more complex. Therefore, I need several layers. In this case, maybe I need several layers of the sacrificial layer. So let's look at one by one. Step number one, the position of sacrificial layer. So the grey one, this one. And then the position of structural layer. So the, the black colour. So here, the position of structural layer. And in fact, sebenarnya, you can tambah lagi. And patterning. Patterning of structural layer. Yeah. And then the position of second sacrificial layer which is this one, second on top of the first one. And then step number four, etching anchor to the substrate. So etching anchor to the substrate, yeah. So you etch away this region here to for you to deposit uh, the second um, structural layer, which will form the anchor between your structure to the substrate. All right, so you etch away this material, this, this part, and then you deposit the second structural layer plus the patterning. Oh, sorry, in this case, the patterning is a separate step. So, this one is patterning. Okay, and then step number seven, etch away all sacrificial layer to release the first structural layer. So, after this, then you etch away. So, in fact, sebenarnya ada satu lagi step kat sini. Step number eight, drying. Okay, yang saya tertinggal. So, sebenarnya saya tertinggal dua step kat sini. Step number eight and the patterning of the structural layer yang pertama. So if you combine this like macam deposition and patterning of such a layer at the same step pun saya boleh terima lah kalau you put it as as a separate step pun okay asalkan benda tu you mention. So saya tak berapa, I'm not very critical on how many steps okay. Yang penting dia punya uh, the description of the step is is being mentioned and it is in order. Dia punya turutan dia tu betul. Berapa banyak step it doesn't matter. You can uh, describe it in six steps or seven steps or eight steps tapi kalau dia punya description tu betul and according to the order then both uh, all three can get full marks all right so dia tak berapa critical sangat tentang how many steps yang penting perincian dia tu so let's look at some of the deposition techniques that you can use to deposit uh, your structural layers and also your sacrificial layers so the deposition technique that you need to use depends on the type of the type of the structural layer. Okay, maknanya dia adakah dia metal, adakah dia uh, is it metal based, is it uh, dielectric or is it uh, polymer, is it organic. So 
it depends on that if you your structure layers are normally metal for example gold or copper or any other metal you can use of course you can use evaporation and sputtering so this evaporation if you remember from your ic fabrication class this evaporation is a uh, this evaporation so it is vacuum eva evaporation okay whereby you heat up your your material gold or copper you heat up using current or using electron beam you heat it up so much inside a vacuum chamber until the gold or the copper becomes vapor so as it becomes vapor it will meruap it will go all around the chamber in vacuum and then you have your your substrate on top of it so the vapor will slowly deposit itself to form layer on top of your substrate okay that is evaporation evaporation um and also sputtering so sputtering if you remember is using plasma so kalau you tak ingat then you have to look back at your notes but basically you use plasma and then the plasma itself the plasma is based on will ionize the plasma gas and then the plasma gas will be will be uh, energized and will be directed onto onto your target so your target material is either gold or copper right so it will it will bombard this plasma on your gold or copper until the gold or copper will be will be released from the target and then it will be free in the in the chamber all right and it will it will form a layer on top of your substrate so these two is can be considered as what we call the physical physical vapor deposition right pvd because it depends on the actual physical movement of your target atoms which are gold or copper or any other material to move from the the source onto your substrate okay so you can have pvd you can have electroplated metal like uh, uh, nickel iron so you know by using electroplating okay by using uh, electroplating which is basically you have your ionic liquid and then you have two electrodes and then you use you, you apply voltage and then you can plate the the metal that you need as uh, something like nickel iron and then if you have plastic material or polymer or or any compound sometimes you can use you can use cvd CVD for plastic, uh, which is chemical vapor deposition. If you remember, so chem CVD, chemical vapor deposition, uh, instead of a physical movement, you are relying on chemical reaction between all the atoms to form the final compound or, or material onto your uh, substrate. And then you can also have epitaxy, molecular beam epitaxy, or by using thermal oxidation also can. Okay, if you want to get silicon or silicon oxide. For sacrificial layer, you have you can have photoresist, polymide, and other organic materials. In this case, the deposition technique, the best is spin coating. Okay, and then if you need to use metal such as copper as your sacrificial layer, of course, you can use the same method as, as described up here, similar to silicon oxide. Copper also can be electroplated or evaporated and it is relatively inexpensive. So it depends on what you want to get. Normally for electroplating, you can get very thick layer. Evaporation, you your layer will be slightly, I mean, you can get thick, but it will take long time. All right. Um, but the quality is higher. The quality of the, the layer is higher compared to electroplating. So there's pros and cons. So it depends on what you really focus on as your final structure. Okay, and you can uh, deposit oxides as well by using plasma enhanced CVD. All right. So CVD, yeah, electroplating, thermal oxidation, physical vapor deposition. So here I just include uh, some description on CVD. 
the machine so this one saya tak ada tanya sangat lah um, all this deposition technique I will not ask you because it has already been evaluated supposed to be evaluated during the IC fabrication course that you have taken so here I just put it as, as, a, as a review okay uh, but um, although I am not, I might not ask you specifically about this individual deposition process. I might ask you in terms of like, much um, uh, maybe to choose which deposition process is more suitable and give your reasoning, something like that. So that that can still be a viable question for this course. Okay, you might not have to describe the process in detail, but you need to evaluate whether it's suitable for your structure and your process or not. Okay, so CVD, PECVD, LPCVD, what are they? Right, electroplating, evaporation. Okay, and sputtering, gas phase, silicon etching. So if you want to etch away your sacrificial layer or you want to etch away your structural layer to pattern it, you can also, instead of using uh, hydrofluoric acid, you can also use a gas phase, silicon etching. Okay, by using this gas, xenon fluoride. I think, yeah, this is the gas that you use, or bromine fluoride, okay. Both are isotropic etching, that means uh, the etching will be isotropic, so it will happen in all direction equally. Organic sacrificial layers such as photoresist, you can, you can remove it by etching, using plasma etching if you want it to be in a dry process or if you don't mind using liquid then of course you can use any suitable solvent and acetone is an example of a universal solvent that can remove almost all photoresist okay all types of photoresist alcohol not all can be uh, removed but acetone most of the photoresist can be removed polymide etching by organic solvent so the advantage of using uh, organic sacrificial layer Okay, such as polymide or basically polymer, same thing, all right, or photoresist is that you don't need high temperature. For the other kind of process, the deposition might require special machine with high temperature. Okay, so if your substrate is very sensitive, because sometimes MEM substrate is not necessarily silicon, it can be something flexible, okay, some you can use polymer, you can use plastic, and high temperature can, can damage the... Um, the substrate itself so in order to avoid using low temperature process then you the material for structural layer and sacrificial layer also must use things which can can be patterned and processed at a low temperature so advantage of using photoresist and polymide extremely low temperature process easy to find structural solution with good selectivity okay so that means you can you can remove it easily without damaging the structure layer the disadvantage Many structural layers such as LPCVD are not compatible. All right, so many structural layers that have to use this is uh, layers that use sebenarnya ni ialah LCVD. So if your structural layer must be patterned and deposited using LPCVD, then you cannot use all this as your photoresist and polymer as your sacrificial layer. They are not compatible. Okay, metal evaporation also is associated with high temperature metal. So, uh, structural layer that can, uh, sacrificial layer that cannot withstand the high temperature cannot be used. Particles. So, it is not com particles. Oh, ini sebenarnya. Ini sebenarnya, let me do the correction here now. Yeah. So, this is 20. Now, so those are some examples. Now, yang ni lagi penting, criteria. Okay, so because a lot of my questions regarding structural layers, structural, uh, yeah, structural and sacrificial layers, okay, in terms of the criteria for selecting materials and etching solution. So what are the criteria that you use in order to to evaluate which layer that is suitable and which etching solution which is suitable for your patterning and removal. 
Alright, so you need to look at firstly the number one, you need to look at the selectivity. How selective is the etching solution? In this case, we are we are focusing on etching solution, right? So selectivity of etching solution. Okay, that means the etching solution will only remove away your sacrificial layer but will not affect your structural layer or your substrate. Etch rate on structural layer or etch rate on sacrificial layer must be high. Uh, so that means the ratio. The ratio of the etch rate of structural layer over the etch rate of the sacrificial layer must be high. Although you can say that certain solvent or etchant does not affect the the structural layer tapi sebenarnya dia mungkin ada effect tapi dia punya etch rate dia tu very very slow so even if the the etchant can actually etch away your structural layer if the ratio of the etch rate of the structural layer over the etch rate of the sacrificial layer is high enough then maybe it is suitable for you to use in that way okay uh, at the end of etching when you have removed all the sacrificial layer the structural layer is still there and then the second criteria is etch rate. Rapid etching rate on sacrificial layer to reduce etching time. So you want to choose the etching solution which have the highest etch rate of the sacrificial layer as possible because we want to re reduce the time. And then thirdly, the deposition temperature. In certain application, it is required that the overall processing temperature be low. Macam saya cakap tadi lah. So you need to know um, for for the whole process from A to Z, the breast sample, mula sampai habis, you can check what are the the apa tu temperature yang mungkin you punya structural layer or sacrificial layer has to go through. So you and then you evaluate if that that layer material is suitable or not, if the etching solution is is suitable or not. And then number four is intrinsic stress of structural layer. To remain flat after release, the structural layer must have low stress. So if you can recall what uh, what you uh, what what I mean by intrinsic stress, okay, it's basically the stress due to the atomic structure or the bonding of the material itself. Okay, because as you go through the process of etching of uh, patterning and everything you most most probably there are the dual sebab yang menyebabkan intrinsic stress ni one is due to temperature as you know changing temperature and then one is due to the changing of phase you, you and then you use uh, water or solution which has uh, surface tension which can can produce intrinsic stress okay so you need to consider intrinsic stress of your structural layer to know whether which etching solution is suitable surface smoothness important for optical application so you also need to make sure that whatever uh, material that you choose and the actual etching solution that you choose okay uh, it will not give any effect on the smoothness of the surface if your device require a very smooth surface all right so if uh, the smoothness of the, of the surface will determine what are the deposition technique that you need to use what are the material and what are the etching solution macam saya cakap tadi uh, kalau you nak deposit metal kalau you boleh you boleh guna electroplating or you can guna evaporation but evaporation will produce a more uniform and smooth surface compared to electroplating or or sputtering right so you need to choose and then number six long term stability so this is in terms of the structural layer so of course when you want to choose your structural layer since this structural layer will form the basis component of your MEMS device you need to make sure that it can withstand the the harsh environment that it will be working in and also whether it can last a long time so long term stability is is a consideration but if your MEMS device some MEMS device are uh used like pakai buang it's like disposable uh, one example of that is uh macam you punya rapid uh, lab on chip punya testing untuk check uh, darah ke apa benda ke so it will be replaced every time you do the measurement right so it, do it doesn't really have to have a long term stability or maybe like if you are using bubble jet printer you remember if you buy bubble jet printer you punya 
the the ink right the ink or you call it what ah the the cartridge right ink cartridge dekat bawah dia kan selalunya ada sekali dengan dia punya print head so the print head is attached to the cartridge itself and that print head is normally basically mems device okay it is basically a mems device a micro nozzle so Uh, long term stability might not be an issue there because you will be using it only a few months and then you have to replace it okay any questions so far okay if no let's look at stiction problem okay what is stiction stiction is basically a combination of sticking and friction Okay, this is a situation whereby you can have your structure which is supposed to be like in this case suspended. Okay, but the cantilever is sticking and then because of friction also it will, um, there's a friction between the, surf the two surfaces. Okay, so it's a combination of sticking and friction. So, kalau you tengok gambar yang mana, kalau, okay, kalau you tengok gambar yang ni, so you have A and B, so let me label this, so this is A. And this is B. So, gambar yang A menunjukkan a lot of stiction happening. So, kalau you tengok yang cantilever beam yang pertama ni, okay, all suspended. How do I know it's all suspended? It's because by looking at the shadow underneath. Okay, and then once you go to the second one, dekat hujung ni, dia dah macam melekat. This one is even more pronounced and so on. Yang, yang dekat sini memang semua melekat lah. Okay, and then for the B, The B situation is all the number one is suspended, 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 suspended. Only for the fourth one, uh, the fifth one, and the fifth one and yang seterusnya yang uh, ada ada sticking kat sini. So all this are stiction problem. So where does this stiction come from? Okay, this origin of stiction. Okay, so as Liquid solution gradually vaporizes. The trapped liquid exerts surface tension force on the microstructure, pulling the device down. So this is normally when during etching, right? During etching, or during during removal of sacrificial layer. So when you are removing your sacrificial layer, yang dekat bawah ni, underneath the the cantilever beam, of course the solution, the etching solution must physically enter here, right? enter here, and then and then dissolve all the sacrificial layer underneath there. Okay, as that process happen, as the liquid solution gradually vaporize. Okay, so lepas you dah remove, then you have to take it out. You have to take it out and you have to dry it out, right? So you perlu dry it out. So this one vaporized during during drying. Let's tambahan dekat situ. During drying. So during the drying process, you dah remove all the liquid. You nak dry kan? Dekat bawah ni still ada stuck. Ada liquid yang stuck underneath here. So this stuck liquid, okay, if you do not remove it uh, completely or if you do not remove it fast enough, okay, it will gradually vaporize. Dia still akan kering. Tapi dia akan kering step by step, so dia akan mengecut lah. So dia punya dia punya miniscus itu akan akan mengecut ke dalam. So as this happen, the miniscus itself, the surface of the liquid will exert surface tension. And if the surface tension is strong enough, okay, compared to the to the to the what do you call this um, kekenyalan cantilever beam ni tu okay the the flexibility of your cantilever beam okay it will be pulled it will be pulled and then dia akan melekat lah antara substrate and your cantilever beam so surfaces can form permanent bond by molecule forces when they are close so bila dia dah melekat due to the surface tension the 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 adhesion lekatan tu can be permanent because of satu That there can be Van der Waals force, okay, acting between the two surfaces, and on top of that, sometimes if you have different material, cantilever beam to lain, substrate to lain, sometimes you akan ada 
difference in electrostatics where you can have electrostatic force okay if the if the polarity is opposite then it will basically um attract each other so what can we do to to avoid or minimize stiction problem and we call this anti stiction method okay let's look at number 1 what can we do number 1 is by using magnetic actuation using magnetic actuation to pull structures away from the surface from the surface okay what do i mean by that okay katakanlah there's no apa tu there's no way that you can rem uh, apa to change the the type of drying that you need to use what you can do is to to have a extra structure on top that is applying magnetic force and if your cantilever beam is metal so the magnetic force is while drying it can it can maintain the cantilever beam to be upright and it will not be pulled down by the surface tension to make sure that the magnetic force is is larger compared to the surface tension force okay so that is one method another method if you can you reduce the surface tension uh, length of arm oh sorry this one is yeah not not really this one is related to the first one lah, basically by by using magnetic okay you can reduce surface tension length of arm so the length of arm ni dia punya surface tension tu akan berkurangan because you compensate dengan magnetic so the limitation of this method is that it only works for structures with magnetic material or metal so kalau you punya cantilever beam tu is ferromagnetic ataupun if it's metal in nature and that can be affected by magnets then it, you can use it lah but if it's if it's not then you cannot use it okay so in in such cases maybe you can use a different method which is i out, outline here method number 2 use organic pillars to support the structure during liquid removal the organic pillars is removed by oxygen plasma etching so what you can do like this is one example if you have a dome a dome structure okay whereby this dome structure should have a hollow body inside okay to form the hollow body inside this area must this volume must be filled with your sacrificial layer first so this gray color are all your sacrificial layer so once you have formed your dome you need to remove the sacrificial layer and for this particular structure what what the designer have done is to create holes on top so that the action or the solution to remove the sacrificial layer ni can enter inside now the problem with this is that once you have removed the sacrificial layer okay the hollow structure body here might be replaced by the solution of your etchant or your solvent so when you dry there's a possibility that when you dry it out there's a possibility that uh, surface tension of the water can pull this part down in the middle so nanti dia akan melekat macam tu dia akan in the middle it will sag down especially if the dome area is big enough okay so to eliminate that we can use what we call organic pillars so we use another kind of organic material and we pattern it down so uh, kita kita pattern kan dia and then kita deposit kan dia semasa apa tu lepas kita dah remove kita one okay so yang green ni is your liquid tau semasa the liquid phase tu during the liquid phase you can add another material okay and then you pattern it so that it will form like macam macam pillar macam tiang yang support the middle part so that it will not sag down okay once you dah ada your pillar ni your organic pillar then you can dry the the green solvent okay to make sure and then this pillar will keep on supporting so to and then once they dah remove all the solvent to remove the pillar you can use oxygen plasma etching okay oxygen plasma etching ataupun sometimes we call it uh, oxygen oxygen plasma ash, plasma kadang-kadang orang panggil plasma asher okay because uh, in this process you will simply burn away the organic material into ash so it will not be traceable okay there, there will be no residue 
So that is another method. Another method, there's another method which is by using supercritical carbon dioxide drying. So this one is quite quite interesting and needs some explanation. Okay. For this supercritical carbon dioxide drying, okay, we can consider this to be the uh, anti-stiction drying method number three. Okay, we are using phase change to uh, this can also be known as phase change release method. So also known as phase change release method. Uh, in this method, we avoid surface tension by relaying, uh, not relaying, by relying, by relying on phase change with less surface tension than water vapor. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Now, let's look at what we call the supercritical state. For certain material, there's a supercritical state whereby at temperature around 31 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 72.8 atmosphere, so very high pressure. So at a high pressure and relatively higher temperature compared to uh, room temperature, okay, you can have a supercritical state for certain material. And in this case, this is a supercritical state for carbon dioxide. Okay, so how does the process go? So step number one, Okay, change water with methanol. So let's say we have um, a bath, right? So this is your bath, and then you have your substrate, and then on top of your substrate is your structure. Let's say your structure is a cantilever beam. So this bath is, is the solution that you use to remove away the, the sacrificial layer underneath the cantilever beam. So, katakanlah um, the action ni is water based. Bermaksud dia, you punya action ni dilarutkan menggunakan uh, air lah. So, it's water based. Alright. So, once you have removed all the all the sacrificial layer underneath, okay, this water based action will fill up all the gaps. Okay, so you tak boleh remove it out from the bath because if you remove it out, the water underneath here will, will start to evaporate and then you will have the stiction problem. So instead of taking it out, you leave it inside the bath. But what you do now is you, you gradually remove the water, you drain the water out and at the same time, you replace it with uh, alcohol, alcohol-based solvent. You replace with alcohol alcohol-based solvent, uh, you, you replace it, you disperse it slowly until the whole bath is filled with your alcohol, in this case, methanol. Once you have replaced it with methanol, you do the same kind of draining, but now you are replacing the methanol with liquid carbon dioxide. Okay, you replace it with liquid carbon dioxide. Um, the reason why we need to use alcohol in between replacing the water with carbon dioxide is because you don't want the reaction to occur between carbon dioxide and water. So reaction can occur. So in order to avoid the reaction, you must first replace the water-based solvent with alcohol-based solvent. And then uh, the alcohol-based solvent too, you remove and then you gradually replace with liquid CO2, carbon dioxide. And you do this at a room temperature at 1200 PSI. Okay, so once you have done that, it is filled with uh, liquid carbon dioxide. Uh, and you need to do all this inside a chamber, right? A controlled chamber because you need to control the pressure. And then you heat up the, the bath. You heat up the liquid carbon dioxide bath to 35 degrees, roughly around that temperature. And the carbon dioxide is vented. Free standing cantilever beams up to 850 micrometer can stay released. So once you increase the temperature, all right, so as you know, supercritical state will happen for carbon dioxide at 31.1 degrees Celsius. So as you heat it up to 35 degrees Celsius rapidly, okay, carbon dioxide will enter this supercritical state. In this supercritical state, um, it is a state whereby Sebenarnya, both liquid, uh, 
gas and solid can occur at the same time. Alright, so at this state juga, the, the, the surface tension is almost negligible. So you can imagine that the water, uh, not the water, sorry, the liquid carbon dioxide is spontaneously evaporating very fast without any surface tension. So they macam, they terus lah, they, they, they terus vent out. So they akan terus jadi vapor. So they, they keluar jadi vapor dengan laju, dengan cepat. Okay, so this is the supercritical regime. So you, 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 di mana liquid and phase can happen at the same time. When a substance is in, when, when a substance in liquid phase at pressure greater than the critical pressure is heated, it undergoes a transition from liquid to supercritical fluid at the critical temperature. So this transition does not involve interfaces ataupun there's no surface tension. There's no visible transition between from liquid to from liquid to gas. Dia tak ada macam ada dia, dia tak ada interface ni. Dia tak ada surface surface tension tu tak ada. Dia terus dia per liquid tu dia boleh spontaneously become gas. Each one of the molecule inside. Okay. So kalau macam evaporation yang biasa only the molecules on the surface yang boleh jadi gas. Tapi kalau at super critical state anything can spontaneously become gas. Alright. So that's that's how you can so when that happens so when the supercritical uh, carbon dioxide is vented so all this liquid carbon dioxide can be vented out it can become gas almost spontaneously so there's no surface tension therefore this free standing cantilever beam will not be pulled down by surface tension because that's a negligible surface tension okay the criteria is that you must make sure that um uh the the what the the chemical that you use is inert ataupun non toxic and then the critical temperature is low all right so the the solution or the material that you can use for to to satisfy this criteria is normally carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide it is non toxic okay and it has relatively low critical temperature Okay, which is 31.1 degrees Celsius. So this is the, the description of the process again. Exchange the methanol with liquid carbon dioxide, heat it up, and then uh, close the vessel, heat it up. No interface is formed. Vent vessel as a, at a constant temperature above critical temperature. So any question regarding supercritical drying? Antistation method number three. Are you guys still here with me? Oh, you tak nampak. Oh, you nampak kan? Okay. Okay. Um, siapa? Eh, uh, Jennifer. Are you doctor? Okay. Number four. Antistation. Method number four is to use what we call SAM, self-assembled monolayer. Okay, these self-assembled monolayer are basically molecules in liquid form. So these molecules are inside a liquid. Okay, what you normally do is you, you deposit this liquid on top of your substrate or on top of your pattern, on top of, of your structure. What does this uh, molecule do is that it will self-assemble itself on the surface. And this self-assembly happens because the molecule itself has some sort of polarity. They are the head and they are the tail. And the head and tail have a polarity. So it's a polarized molecule. Okay, Whereby either the head or the tail can be attracted to the surface. Okay, when that happens, this molecule will self-assemble themselves, forming low stiction, chemically stable surface coating using self-assembled monolayer. The SAM file is comprised of closed packed array of alkyne chain, which spontaneously form an oxidized silicon, uh, which spontaneously form on oxidized silicon surface and can remain stable after 18 months in air. 
Okay, an example of an SAM is an octodacyl trichlorosilin. Okay, uh, so an example like this, so macam mula-mula you, uh, these are the molecules inside the solution and then you drop it onto your substrate. What will happen is that the, the heat of the, normally the either, either the silane heat or the, 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 I'm not sure lah which one, but normally the silane heat lah could. So the silane part of it, silane is this, is this one. Okay, the silane part of it will be either at the top ataupun they attracted to the surface. So they can assemble themselves as a file. So this is what I call a file lah. Dia macam aturan like a file, like an arrangement of file. So it will rearrange itself like this. When it rearrange itself like this, okay, uh, basically now the surface of your substrate, so if this is your substrate, the surface of your substrate is being shielded by this SAM molecule. So this SAM molecule will shield the substrate from the water or the liquid lah. So that means surface tension will not have any effect on the surface because the surface tension of water itself cannot, is is it becomes hydrophobic in a sense whereby the water cannot form any surface tension with the surface. So if you can imagine normally, kalau surface right, kalau you taro air kan normally you, you will get water to be able, to be like that. But with the self assembled monolayer, okay, the water will not be able to to stick to it, so it will become like a ball. So it become hydrophobic. So if if the water cannot stick to the surface, then it can never apply any surface tension to it. Therefore, you don't have to worry about stiction. All right. So these are the steps in the SAM formation. So you need to rinse your substrate with uh, alcohol first, all right, to remove the water, and then you rinse it again with a uh, CCL four, and then you put your this is your self-assembled uh, octodac apa ni tadi octodacyl trichlorosilin solution, and then you rinse with this uh, CCL four again. Okay, that's all I think. That's all for surface micro machining. All right. So these are some example complex three D microstructures. That people have, yang ni pun macam zaman-zaman sebenarnya dah lama dah ni like 20 years ago. So now maybe what what people can do in the industry, the technology has become more advanced and the structure maybe is is more advanced than this. Okay, and maybe more as uh, much smaller than this. Some gear and everything. So some structure and this is an example of di digital micro mirror display. So this is also very. A very uh, uh, intricate design of MEMS, right? So it, this is in, in such a way that you can have a display whereby the micro mirror is responsible in in changing the refraction and reflection of the pixels color because you know one pixel um one pixel consists of blue, green, and red, right? Or red, cyan, and magnet magneta something like that so blue the the primary colors like right? blue yellow and red okay so by by changing the micro mirror so you are changing the way that the light this blue red yellow light is refracted and reflected okay you can change the color that you perceive so this is quite an advanced lah punya device and this is why long time ago this kind of display is very expensive because you can imagine that every single pixel is a moving digital micro mirror so very fascinating, right? And then hinges, okay. And then this is just a demonstration of actually building uh, complex 3D structures. In this case, they they made a tower, maybe a tower of, of, of a cathedral or something like that. This is uh, a MEMS micro cantilever, micro, bukan cantilever, micro, Apalah, penyepit apa dalam bahasa Inggeris tu saya lupa dah. Uh, penyepit dalam bahasa Inggeris is... There's a name for it. Oh, this, this, uh. Uh, 
um, dia dah penyepit lah nanti you cari lah apa, apa. <laughs> saya pun tiba blur penyepit so basically a, a gripping arm right so this is the gripping end so you grip okay so this is the structure so these are the structure okay this is the gripping arm so it can move inside and outside to grip and then these are the springs these are all the flexible part that enables the the gripping to to occur something like this okay this is some other examples okay this is all these are complex 3d microstructures that i get from the literature all right and then this is an example of a different kind of microfabrication which is bottom up nano devices so all the examples that i've shown you based on bulk micro machining and surface micro machining are top to bottom punya patterning top to bottom punya mic uh, micro machining whereby you start with the bulk material and then you shape it down into the desired uh, structure so here is a bottom up nano device whereby you use uh, in this particular example uh, this is an actual uh, research picture of what i did when i was doing my phd right so uh, we are trying to build an array of nano needles made out of carbon so instead of starting with a big carbon substrate and then shaping it down uh, we we use a cvd to individually uh, arrange carbon atoms to form these nano needles all right so this is an image from a uh, scanning electron microscope okay here is your this this is a tungsten needle this tungsten needle the width of the needle itself is um i don't remember exactly but maybe around 0 0.2 0 0.2 millimeter or something like that or maybe less 0 0.2 millimeter i think or maybe less okay so and then i have to uh, manually etch away the tip so this tip here which you can see here the tip itself here tak silap saya dalam a mm, maybe like a few micron kot kalau based on the scale kat sini a few micron so now this this tip is very sharp right if, if it's a few micron it's very very sharp okay um compared to maybe less than a micron i don't know kalau, kalau you tengok kat sini this from here to here is 50 micron so if the tip of the the tip of the the probe here is somewhere around there so it might be like one micron or maybe less but the bottom line is it's, it's very halus okay the, it, it's very halus because i have to etch it manually but even so the structure of the nano needle is even much smaller so if you look here this is the nano needle so this is an an array or a forest of nano needle this is a nano needle as well ni nano needle yang tak jadi sangat okay, dia, dia tak dia tak tajam so kalau you zoom out memang tak nampak this you can you, you cannot really see this micro needle so this this uh, example of of structure is the target of the application is for very external uh, exto, itu mungkin ekstodermal punya probe for skin alright for drug delivery and also non-invasive punya uh, lab on chip punya system alright so yeah so basically it's very halus lah and then this is another close up view so because the probe is very thin it's very fragile so bila saya move 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 dia kadang-kadang dia terlanggar dia terus bengkok very fragile but here I want to show you although the 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 metal ni lebih besar okay dia punya tip ni the, this is tungsten all right uh, dia, dia boleh bengkok tapi yang saya punya micro needle ni i want to demonstrate that it can withstand some force because it is flexible so here i have to physically touch it so the reason i touch kat bawah ni i touch the substrate and touch on top is one there's, there's two reasons lah. one i want to measure the mechanical robustness of the nano needle and secondly i want to measure the electrical conductivity so i i apply bias between here and here so negative bias positive bias and i want to measure how much current is flowing so i want to know the conductivity of the the needle itself and then yeah so and then i have to manually adjust the machine in order to to really touch the 
the tip. So kalau tengok sini, now we are at 10 micrometer. So I have measured this and I estimated that the tip of the nano needle is maybe around 10. It varies lah. Uh, I think it might go below that but uh, but apa yang saya anggarkan han between 10 to 20 nanometer. Maybe a bit less depending on which one you are looking at. Right, so I have to touch. So how do I move? So how do I move this needle, right? So inside the uh, scanning electron microscope, this tungsten needle that I have fabricated, I attach it to what we call a nanoprobe. Nano, nanoprobe, nanoprobing machine. I got nanoprobing. Nanoprobing machine. Now this nanoprobing machine is basically just a motor sebenarnya dia, 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 dia punya it's a three axis punya actuator so it's it's it in it itself is an example of a MEMS device it as it's a three axis punya motor whereby i uh, whereby it uses uh piezo piezo electric actuation so remember a uh, piezo Electric actuation is when you apply bias across the material. Piezoelectric material can either contract or expand. So if you apply a certain bias and if you apply the bias at the AC frequency, so it can basically expand and contract really fast according to the frequency. And this fast vibration, you can attach it to a micro gear. All right, so this micro gear can actually move. So you can create the movement, very subtle movement. And the movement can be very, very very little so you can control it up to a nano scale a few nanometer at any one time all right so it's very interesting so i was very fortunate to be able to to work with this and then yeah itu jelah kot ada lagi kat sini tak ada yeah so ada lagi satu picture sebenarnya yang menunjukkan saya push i push this and then this this needle becomes flex macam ni so the uh, and then by reading the 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 measurement from the micro machine probe too i can measure how much force is being exerted at the opposite direction and i can i can measure lah dia punya force the flexibility and then use hooke's law just normal hooke's law to find what is the elasticity of this material okay so and then this is another example this is not my device so yeah ini yang saya dapat dari the literature some other group from japan this is an example where this is also an example of a bottom up nano device whereby they deposit uh, a layer atom by atom uh, in this case yeah using molecular beam epitaxy mbe and then they pattern it and then they deposit another material on top here so that it will become liquid phase as it heated up and then this liquid phase will have surface tension and then this surface tension will end up pulling all these uh, plates okay pulling it up until it combined into a box so this is a nano box so it's nanya dia nak buat nano nano uh nano test tube so nanya dia nak buat nano test tube you know what a test tube is a test tube is macam test tube and tabung uji kan so nak buat tabung uji dalam bentuk nano scale so if you can see here between this this line is 15 nanometer so the whole thing is in nanometer scale. I don't know how much, maybe less than 100 nanometer or something like that. So it's very, very small. To make a, a test tube with the area of less than 100 by 100 nanometer is quite an achievement. Lah. Okay, those are just the examples that I wanted to show. So that's all from me. That's the end of our lecture. All right. So uh, as a summary, we have looked at the difference between bulk and surface micro machining and then we have looked at the structural and sacrificial layers for surface micro machining what are the surf, uh, what are the process step in surface micro machining different deposition techniques and then the in this different deposition technique you just you you have the consideration consideration of what what layer and what process to use and then stiction problem Station and solution. So yang penting ialah yang ni lah. Yang penting ialah this one, this one, and this.